I have given my life to the preparation of courageous and sacrificial leaders, to the preparation of a generation of people who would bring conviction and courage and a sense of themselves, but also a willingness to edit and a willingness to change a willingness to even to have the backspace key hit on things that may feel as deep as part of their character. That's what I've given my life to, and I have to admit to you that even in the past couple of weeks, I have struggled a bit. The honest reality is that I am a person trying to lead myself in, in this world, and in the last couple of weeks, I was on a walk, and I was experiencing this moment, and it wasn't just about this moment, it was about the whole of my life, and I was struggling. And I thought to myself, you know, I know that I'm known as a person who asks leaders hard questions. Some of the leaders would say, I ask questions that make your brain hurt a little bit, that you know are important, but sometimes are difficult to approach. And so I thought I should ask myself some of those questions. And in real time, I thought, what would change if I knew why I was here and what I should do next? And I thought to myself, I, I, I do know why I'm here. I sometimes struggle to believe it, but I do know why. What would change if there was purpose driving my next step forward? And the thing that came to mind in that moment was I walk across these stone steps to my office every day, and I thought I would walk across those steps with so much intention if that were true. What would change if, there, if I was showing up better under pressure, if I was staying clear and convicted and also connected to the people that are around me that matter so much? And I thought, man, if I could do that, first of all, the honest truth is I would listen to my answer to the first two questions. And I thought it would be so much better for the people around me if I could be that. What would change if I were applying the lessons from my past experiences? And, and the honest story there is that some of my past experiences are failures. But I've learned a lot from those experiences. I thought I should lean into those things. What would change, Rob, if you knew your unique skills and your competencies and also your blind spots? And I do. And I have people who have given me feedback about those. But sometimes it's hard to just lean in. What would change if I knew what motivates me? I immediately thought I would do those things. That's what I would do. What would change if I were surrounded by cheerleaders, mentors, and people who give it to me straight? And the honest truth is, as I stand here today, I am. Sometimes I almost feel guilty because I'm so surrounded by people, just amazing people. And then, Rob, what would change if you were intentionally investing in the growth and development of others? And I think I'm in a season where it feels like that's most of what I'm trying to do. And as I was answering those questions, I got to tell you, I was on this walk, and I started to actually stand up straighter. A very strange experience. I am the son of a three-time university president. My mother and father led universities throughout my childhood. And our dinner table conversations were so much more like... <laughs> an advisory board session sometimes in the best kind of ways than they were like family dinner table conversations. Because it was one of those places where my parents could be whole and they could be real. And if my dad was in the middle of a building campaign to build a science building, you know, that seems like a great thing, an awesome thing to be a part of. But the reality in the whole story was this. There was probably somebody from the community who was suing the university because they didn't want that building there. And there were probably faculty in the sciences or in the humanities who said that the sciences don't matter. We don't need a science building. And then there were probably parents who were frustrated because their children wanted to study the sciences and the building wasn't done yet. And that's just part of the story. My parents are incredible human beings, but they have a whole story that includes both amazing redemptive moments and fragmentation. And I had a leader say to me at one point a couple of years ago said, so, Rob, what you tried to do is rebuild that dinner table for other leaders. And I, I, I think he was right. I ended up becoming an industrial organizational psychologist. First of all, I have to admit to you, because it sounds smart. Like, I just realized, like, it sounds smarter than me. And then, but, it, but there's a deeper story there, is that I've, I've been fascinated by organizations and how people within them function and how people lead for most of my life. And as a part of that journey, I've been a, able to be a part of multiple longitudinal studies where we followed the journey of leaders across seasons of their life for, for years for some of those studies. And I'll tell you that as you lean into the leadership theory, that's, there's, there's decades of research that we know about leaders. 
as you lean into it, there is an, an incredible story and fabric and tapestry that, that comes together when you begin to talk to leaders across the different seasons of their lives. Incredible moments. But why leaders? This is a word we throw around, but why leaders? Few of us would deny that our world is in the midst of a reformation. A radical shift in dividing polarities and paradoxes. Whether it's the tension between relativism and fundamentalism, liberty and security, mercy and justice, love and truth, or even unity and diversity, these are the paradoxes of our time. And while those things are deeply philosophical and political and ideological, they are also very practical and affecting every single one of us. And they're affecting every leader that you know. Every major movement of change in our world begins with two things. It begins with a deep need and a leader. And we spend so much time talking about the critically important needs of our world. And what I see is so little time being invested in what it actually means to prepare leaders to move into those needs. But it begs for, it begs for there's another question in this. When we talk about leaders, when I use that word, what do I mean? We played a game as children that was about this word. You all know the game. Follow the leader. And none of us ever showed up to the local bushes. That's what my neighborhood was like. And we showed up with the kids and we said, I'll play your silly game. I never said this. If you just define the difference between a leader and a manager. We never did that. We just started to play. And if I was the leader, I started to crawl over furniture, over picnic tables, through the bushes, into closets. And I'm looking back going, are you people still there? Are you still coming along for this? And it, asked, it, it kind of, we knew as children what this is about. And it, it caused me to think, what was the fundamental rule for the leader? If they're going to play the game. And the rule was this. The leader goes first. The leader goes first. And some of you might be wrestling with my definition because you say, no, no, no. A leader listens. A leader has courage. A leader is compassionate. I would say yes. But we just qualified this word. We all want certain things. But when we strip it down, a leader goes first. So what do we know about the reality of going first. And there is tr a tremendous body of research that we could lean into. And I'll tell you just a few of the things we know. One thing is this, that leaders learn from experience. If I ask any of you, any one of you to be here with me and to, will you lead us? Will you step out to the edge of this stage and will you lead us? You would learn from that experience, but here's what it would be like. There would be just as likely, just as many chances that you would fail as you would succeed. And when you fail, we probably would blame you for it. And when you succeed, we probably won't give you as much credit as you deserve. And that the experience is, did you know that role models will play a critical role in all of our development? And one third of the time, they will be bad ones. So I tell leaders that, what an incredible thing. If you're being a hor horrible role model, you're a lesson for somebody. That's one thing we know. Here's what else we know. It's incredibly isolating. When a human being steps out and goes first, suddenly the people that they were with don't see them the same way. Suddenly the idea of transparency becomes much more challenging because now, if you're a manager, you may know things about those people that were your coworkers before that you legally can't share. I don't say this to be abrupt or to increase that dissonance you might feel, but it's the reality. It's what they're experiencing every day. That they will be crucible moments. And when we say fail fast and fail, fo fail forward, man, we're not talking about failures. They, leaders have learned for generations from failure, but these are, these are failures that are difficult. It's just an isolating role. It's an isolating role. But the last thing is this. When you become a leader and you step out and you go first, and I hope if you don't see yourself as a leader, you will not dismiss yourself from what I'm saying. Because whether you're a parent or a president, I hope you can relate to this. 
Suddenly, it's not enough for you to be you. What leaders are really dealing with is the necessity for understanding themselves and staying connected to every other person within their influence. And here's the real challenge, is that many of the people in their influence will want different things. So that's the reality of going first. That's what it's like. And if we were to prepare a person for any other job, we prepare a person to be an accountant, we would have them read the accounting textbook from chapters 1 through 16, all of it. If we're going to prepare a surgeon, we will teach them to do surgery. At least I hope we'll teach my surgeon to do surgery. We will teach them all of it. If we taught someone to sail, we would teach them to use the sails, to navigate, to swim, to use communication radios. We would teach all of it. But instead, what we do with leaders is we take them down to the leadership dock. We untie the rope and we say, now you know your personality, so go lead. Or we say, now you, we, you know what you're good at, so go lead. Or we say, now you know how to be more vulnerable, so go lead. All of those things are important. Don't hear me saying for a moment that they're not. But they're only part of the story. There is a whole story of what it means to develop and prepare a person to go first. So where do we begin? Where could we begin? The first thing for, for everyone that I would so encourage is embrace whole. And when I say whole, I mean embrace all of it. The real story of every single one of us is a wild ride. And it includes both tremendous redemptive moments and successes and ascensions, but it also includes our failures. To learn from those things, those places where we've let people down. The whole story is like that. And our glimpses of wholeness, this is the challenge of even beginning to talk about this is that it requires an invitation to our fragmentation, to places where we're not. But that invitation produces what's like a constructive dissonance, a willingness to say something might need to change. And that invitation is so necessary to bring about more deep and enduring change in each one of us. So embrace whole. The second thing is this, focus on the one with an eye to the many. Most of our solutions to leadership problems are where we focus on the many and then we look to the one. We have general principles that we try to apply. We read a five-step airport book that says, here's the way to lead. But the reality of every leader we work with, because some of those categorizations matter, but the life of any person, of any human being, in this moment where they may go first is bespoke, customized. It includes ins and outs in the way it gets worked out in your life. The third thing is this, to invest for the long haul. And when I say long haul, I mean two things. I haven't been asked over the years many times, Dr. McKenna, how long does it take to develop a leader? And I will tell people, two to three years, to get them ready to go first. Not just to go first, to, to, to be a leader, but to just to be ready. It may take that amount of time. But there's another part of this long haul investment. And it's this, what if every person here listening to me today was here for something that you may be beginning, but may be finished and continued through your children? or maybe not even through your children, through someone you've never met, how would it change your perspective, your whole perspective on what this moment is about if we knew that what we're starting in a part of maybe someone else's to finish and continue? How would it change if we did that? And the last thing is this. I want to invite you to questions. So much of the way that we think about developing leaders is prescribed. And I'll tell you that answers matter. But that it's the invitation to questions that you haven't answered yet with some scaffolding that can be so transformational for a person. I had a leader in India come up to me and he said, I will never forget this moment. He said, Dr. McKenna, how do I know when it's my time to lead? <laughs> you know what my answer was? Yes! Because he was listening. <laughs> I don't
don't know when his time to lead is, but I'm going to be there when it happens. And he was asking the question that will, that will prepare him for that moment where he steps out and goes first. So I want to finish asking you some questions to pause for just one moment. What would change if you knew why you're here and what you should do next? What would change if there was purpose driving your next step forward? What would change if you were better in those high pressure moments? What would change if you were applying the lessons from your past experiences? What would change if you understood your unique skills, competencies, and your blind spots? What would change if you were surrounded by cheerleaders, mentors, and people who give it to you straight? What would change if we were inviting others into those same questions? Maybe everything. Maybe everything. Thank you.